Rick and Susan seemed to have it all a big house in a peaceful neighborhood, two lovely kids, good jobs, and financial security. But hidden within the Wemsley household were dark secrets. Things took a turn when the police received an unusual 911 call just before Christmas. When officers arrived at the quiet town of Mansville, Texas, they found the garage doors open and the side door unlocked. Inside, they discovered a tragic scene. Rick Wemsley, a well-liked local accountant, and his cheerful wife Susie were found dead. It seemed the crime had happened well before the emergency call was made. Rick and Susie knew each other from high school in Oklahoma in the 1970s, though they weren't close back then. Years later, they reconnected while Rick was at Oklahoma State University and Susie was at a Christian college. Their relationship grew, and they decided to get married, start a family, and grow old together. They tied the knot and welcomed their daughter Sarah in 1978, followed by their son Andrew six years later. Rick became a certified accountant and worked in the oil and gas industry. The family moved several times due to his career opportunities, eventually settling in Fort Worth, Texas, near the Trinity River. Fort Worth is a large but cozy city with a rich history. There, Rick set up his own accounting practice from home, which provided a good income. By 2003, the Wemsleys lived in an upscale neighborhood in Mansville, about 20 miles from Fort Worth. Sarah, now 25, had become a mother and lived on her own, while 19-year-old Andrew had just finished high school and was attending college while working part-time at a mini golf course. Rick and Susie had a happy marriage and celebrated their 25th wedding anniversary in July 2003 with friends and family. In December of that year, Rick and Susan wanted to have a special family celebration for their 25th Christmas together. Susie put a lot of effort into making the day perfect. She spent hours picking out decorations and gifts, and she adorned their home inside and out with festive garlands and Christmas figurines. A large Christmas tree, covered in bright lights and colorful ornaments, stood in the living room, with presents wrapped and placed underneath. Susie wrapped each gift with love, imagining how happy her family would be when they opened them. This cozy holiday scene took a dark turn when, on December 11, 2003, at 11.41 p.m., the Mansville emergency dispatcher received a call from the Wemsley home. There was only silence on the other end, suggesting that someone needed help but couldn't speak. The dispatcher quickly sent a patrol car to the house. Upon arrival, the police officers circled the house, peering through the windows. They got no response from knocking or ringing the doorbell, but they found the side door to the garage open. The officers entered the home, walking through the kitchen where they noticed the landline phone off the hook and lying on the table. In the living room, they found 45-year-old Susie Wemsley lying cold on the couch. In the foyer, near the front door, they discovered 46-year-old Rick Wemsley in a pool of blood. Sadly, it was clear that both were beyond help. At 12.17am, paramedics arrived and confirmed that Rick and Susie were dead. The house was immediately sealed off, and an investigation began. The autopsy revealed that Susie had died from a gunshot wound and had also been stabbed seven times, likely after she had already passed away. It's believed she was attacked while she was dozing on the couch in the living room. Detectives discovered two bloody palm prints that might have been left by the perpetrator, as well as a bullet, two pieces of a blue plastic hair clip, and another piece of plastic on the floor nearby. Rick Wemsley met the same tragic end as his wife, but possibly not as quickly. Bullet holes in the headboard of the bed in the master bedroom suggested that the attack on Rick began there before moving to the hallway. There was no blood in the bedroom, leading investigators to believe that Rick woke up from the gunshots and either fled the room or confronted the intruder himself. It appeared that Rick wasn't willing to go down without a fight, as evidenced by a tuft of hair found in his left hand, indicating a struggle. This hair became crucial evidence. Rick was also shot and suffered approximately 11 knife wounds to his back. The detectives carefully combed through every room in the house, examining all carpets and furniture for clues. The hair found in Rick's hand and the broken hair clip on the living room floor were sent for DNA analysis. The Wemsley's spacious home was thoroughly checked for fingerprints, and investigators searched each room for signs of robbery. Initially, they considered the possibility that the family had interrupted a burglary, causing the intruders to resort to violence. 
However, the excessive number of stab wounds suggested otherwise. This theory was further dismissed when nearly $115,000 in cash was discovered in the master bedroom. A thief would have easily found and taken this money, but since it remained untouched in the bedside table, robbery was ruled out as a motive. It was later confirmed that no valuables were missing from the house, and there were no signs of forced entry. Neighbours and friends were horrified by the shocking news. They couldn't fathom who would commit such a heinous act against Rick and, Rick and Susie, who were beloved in the community. Wonderful people. It's... It is a tragedy because it's unexpected. I just couldn't believe it. You just don't think of that happening close by. The couple often hosted guests in their home and were known for their kindness and willingness to help others. The sudden, brutal crime in this quiet neighborhood, especially just before the holidays, left everyone feeling anxious and fearful. Rick and Susie Wemsley appeared to have an ideal life. They lived in a spacious house where Rick thrived as an accountant. He also enjoyed gardening and taking his son to Texas Rangers baseball games. Susie was a dedicated homemaker who kept the household running smoothly and cared deeply for their children. In her free time, she loved spending quality moments with her son and daughter. However, what occurred behind closed doors turned out to be far more troubling than the serene life they seemed to lead. According to some sources, there were more layers to this seemingly perfect family. There was always tension inside the Wemsley house, particularly concerning their two children, Sarah and Andrew. As a teenager, Sarah was kicked out of the house for misbehavior, leading her to become pregnant at 19 and enter into an unhealthy relationship with her daughter's father, Todd Cleveland. Sarah often argued with her younger brother Andrew the two siblings never felt much affection for each other. According to Sarah's ex-boyfriend, the Wemsley family was always wary of outsiders, even their friends, suspecting that people were only pretending to be close to them to gain something. This mistrust extended to their own family, contributing to an underlying unhappiness despite their growing prosperity. Reports suggested that Rick and Susie's marriage was unstable, although they tried to maintain appearances in public. The Wemsleys had an agreement with their children if they enrolled in college and stayed in school. They would receive financial support. This arrangement didn't work out with Sarah, but Andrew convinced his parents that he was committed to honoring his part of the deal. As a result, Susie and Rick gifted him a new white Mustang, paid for his insurance, and provided money for other expenses. Andrew continued living at home without contributing to the household budget, and everything seemed fine except that he didn't keep up his end of the bargain. Like his sister, Andrew dropped out of college without completing his education. When his parents eventually discovered that he had left school, they stopped supporting him financially. However, they didn't go as far as to kick him out of the house. Despite the ongoing tension, Andrew, now 19, chose to spend most of his free time hanging out with friends at the local Pancake House. A restaurant specialising in breakfasts, the Pancake House was where Andrew's friend introduced him to his sister, 19-year-old Chelsea Richardson. Sarah Wemsley was informed of her parents' deaths at 4 a.m., soon after their bodies were discovered. However, the police couldn't locate the younger son, Andrew. The authorities had already appealed to the media, asking for any sightings of Andrew's white Mustang. While forensic experts continued their work at the crime scene, a white Mustang arrived at the Wemsley house. Andrew and his girlfriend, Chelsea Richardson, stepped out of the car. They had been staying at Chelsea's place for several days, that morning, they learned about the tragic events at the Wemsley home while watching the news. The police immediately asked Andrew and Chelsea to follow a service vehicle to the station for questioning. Andrew's interview lasted about 45 minutes. He revealed that he hadn't been home or communicated with his parents for several days as he had been living with Chelsea. The police noted fresh scratches on Andrew's hand, adding to the investigation's interest. There was nothing suspicious in Andrew's story so the police allowed him to leave the station. However, they requested that he sign a consent form permitting them to search his car. During a conversation with his sister after the interrogation, Andrew mentioned that forensic experts might find their mother's blood in the Mustang. He explained that their mother had recently cut her finger and, for some reason, had taken his car to drive to the store, which could explain any potential blood traces. 
Chelsea Richardson's statement at the police station matched Andrew's perfectly. She confirmed they had been together for the past two days and had been inseparable since they began dating the previous fall. They often spent entire nights in a 24-hour cafe playing Master Duel, a Japanese collectible card game where players use cards to battle each other, simulating battles between fantastic monsters. The game's central character was described as a weak, infantile boy who became a hero when he played. This shared interest deeply bonded Andrew and Chelsea, and they had started thinking seriously about marriage. Chelsea's mother supported their relationship and was fond of Andrew. However, Rick and Susie Wemsley were openly disappointed with Andrew's choice of partner. They had hoped for a different kind of girl for their son. The Richardsons lived on the outskirts of Fort Worth in a working-class area known as the Blue Collar District, which was a stark contrast to the upscale neighbourhood of Mansfield, where the Wemsleys lived. A few years earlier, Chelsea had lost her beloved father to a heart attack, and her mother sometimes worked three jobs to make ends meet. Despite their financial struggles, the Richardsons were known for their generosity. Chelsea, an extroverted and cheerful person, was quite popular at her school. Her lively and happy disposition earned her the nickname Bubbles. Chelsea Richardson's best friend, Susanna Padana, sometimes benefited from Chelsea's generosity. When Susanna had disputes with her own mother, she was warmly welcomed into the Richardson home, where she stayed for several months. The three teenagers Andrew, Chelsea and Susanna were together on the night of Andrew's parents' deaths. Chelsea's ex-boyfriend, Jeremy Lavender, confirmed their alibi, stating that they were at his house the entire time. Sarah Wemsley informed the police that her daughter's father, Todd Cleveland, might be involved in her parents' deaths. They had been arguing about custody and Sarah had recently threatened to call Child Protective Services on him. A day after this threat, and about a month before the tragedy, another suspicious incident occurred. In an early November, while returning home with her parents after a horseback riding lesson, Sarah experienced a frightening event. As they drove through a neighboring town looking for a place to eat, her father's jeep suddenly jolted. Rick thought they might have hit a large stone, but upon inspection, they found a bullet hole in the rear of the vehicle. Frightened and confused, Susie made two phone calls. Oddly, her first call was to her son Andrew, not the police. She believed that a white Mustang had been following them from the ranch, assuming it was Andrew's car. However, this assumption changed after the Jeep was shot at. Susie's second call was to the police, and she filed a report about the incident. Sarah recalled suspecting. Todd Cleveland at the time, but now she questioned why her mother had called Andrew first. It turned out that both Sarah and Andrew stood to inherit a $1 million insurance policy from their father. Additionally, the family home was valued at about $1,650,000 and there was around $100,000 in cash plus other assets left by Rick and Susie. Investigators considered Sarah's suspicions and eventually ruled out her former partner, Todd, as a suspect. Given the financial benefits and family tensions, the investigators continued to focus on the Wemsley children. However, DNA analysis and fingerprinting did not match any family members, indicating no direct connection to the crime scene for either Rick and Susie's son or daughter. Despite the lack of physical evidence, Sarah filed a petition to block Andrew from inheriting any family assets. She believed he was responsible for their parents' deaths and feared for her own safety. Although forensic examination of Andrew's car confirmed the presence of blood on the back seat and headrests, the Mustang had been thoroughly washed, making it impossible for experts to collect a viable DNA sample. Law enforcement couldn't even determine whose blood it was. Several months after Rick and Susie's tragic deaths, the investigation hit a dead end. The district attorney needed more information, so the police department convened a grand jury and began issuing subpoenas to those connected to the deceased couple. They started by verifying the alibis of the son and daughter. Jeremy Lavender, Chelsea's ex-boyfriend, testified under oath that Andrew and his friends were with him that night, providing a solid alibi. Chelsea's best friend Susanna corroborated this and after giving her testimony, she voluntarily provided a DNA sample to compare with evidence from the crime scene. No one expected this moment would become a turning point in the investigation. Susanna Tadano had moved to Texas from Illinois a few years earlier. She didn't fit in well with her new classmates. She wasn't particularly diligent, smart, or charismatic. Susanna frequently skipped classes and argued with her mother. 
Chelsea Richardson became Susanna's lifeline, and the two grew so close that Chelsea wrote a note in the school yearbook celebrating their strong friendship and even composed a poem titled Friends Forever. When investigators compared Susanna Tadano's DNA with the strand of hair found in Rick's hand and DNA from the broken hair clip at the crime scene, they found a match. This revelation indicated there was much more to the story. Susanna was arrested on suspicion of killing the Wemsley couple and faced the possibility of the death penalty. Realizing the severity of her situation, Susanna began to talk. Initially, Susanna claimed that on the night of the crime, she was walking with a friend, a 25-year-old man named Hilario Cardas. She said Hilario had a gun and needed money. According to her story, Hilario entered the Wemsley house alone in the middle of the night while she stayed outside. When she heard gunshots, she ran into the house, where Rick Wemsley allegedly begged her to stop the attack. Susanna claimed she couldn't intervene because she wasn't really involved. Her hair was left in the house during the chaos. But who was Hilario Cardas? It turned out he worked as a night manager at a local restaurant where the friends frequently spent their leisure time. Hilario had a young daughter and was in desperate need of money. He learned about the Wemsley family's wealth through Andrew Wemsley, whom he had met and befriended. During questioning, Hilario denied any involvement in the attack, but admitted to acquiring a gun for $200 at Andrew Wemsley's request. Andrew, Chelsea and Susanna had planned to practice target shooting with an acquaintance. Arm investigators sought to verify Hilario's story, starting with the owners of the property where the teenagers supposedly practiced shooting. The property owner, a friend of Chelsea's mother, confirmed that a few months before the tragedy, Andrew, Chelsea and Susanna came to her approximately three-acre plot to practice shooting at a small pond. However, she had never seen or heard of Hilario Cardas. Hilario further gained the police's trust by passing a lie detector test. The pond on the farm property was drained and forensic experts collected bullets from the bottom. They matched the bullets fired in the Wemsley house, confirming that the three teenagers had indeed been practicing their marksmanship for several months, preparing for the crime. This evidence discredited Susanna's initial story, accusing Hilario of attacking the Wemsley couple. She was given another opportunity to tell the truth, and this time she directly implicated her best friend in a more detailed account. According to Susanna's new version, the three teenagers spent nights at a local cafe plotting their sinister plans. They calculated that, after Rick and Susie's deaths, Andrew would inherit over a million dollars, a sum that would set them up for life. The friends envisioned living together, with Susanna quitting her hated low-paying job and buying a new car. They convinced Hilario to purchase a gun for them. After target practice on the farm, the group concluded that Susanna was the most accurate shooter among them. Their first plan involved shooting at Rick's Jeep's gas tank. If successful, this would have caused an explosion, potentially killing Rick and his family. However, the plan did not go as intended. The plan to eliminate the Wemsley family for financial gain started with an attempt to shoot at Rick's Jeep's gas tank. When that failed, the teenagers Andrew, Chelsea and Susanna decided to break into the Wemsley house, intending to stage it as a robbery. Chelsea's frustration with Susanna led her to pressure Susanna into following through with the plan. Susanna, armed with a gun, was hidden in Andrew's bedroom closet. After several hours of indecision, she and the others proceeded with their plan early on December 11, 2003. Susanna shot Susie on the couch, then attempted to shoot Rick in the master bedroom, missing and waking him up. A struggle ensued, and Andrew took the gun from Susanna, delivering fatal shots to his father. Chelsea and Andrew then inflicted additional wounds on Rick before fleeing. Susanna's testimony, though initially inconsistent, became the cornerstone of the case against her friends. She confessed to her involvement and implicated Chelsea and Andrew in the crime. The investigation and subsequent trial revealed a complex web of deceit, manipulation, and betrayal among the teenagers. Chelsea Richardson, once seen as the mastermind, was convicted and sentenced to death. Her sentence was later commuted to life imprisonment after her defense argued that her best friend, Susanna, was the primary instigator. Andrew Wemsley received a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 2044, while Hilario Cardas, involved in the conspiracy but not the attack, was sentenced to 50 years. Susanna Tadano, who provided crucial testimony, was also convicted and will be eligible for parole in 2034. The tragic story highlights how ambition and envy can drive individuals to commit heinous acts, ultimately